Welcome, everyone, to the Fall 2021 Martin and Gardner Celebration of Mind Talks. We've had some amazing talks, and uh, today I am uh, happy to be able to introduce Alejandre Muniz, who's going to be telling us how to roll two dice, which sounds like uh, kind of a joke, maybe, but um, many of you, I imagine, are familiar with Sickerman dice. And as a special treat, we actually have George Sickerman here today with us. Um, who's going to participate in an interview uh, during Alejandre's talk. So uh, this, this will be a special treat. So, right, this, is, this is talk is titled How to Roll Two Dice. So um, first thing I do is going to be probably review, which is how to roll one die. Um, so you um, take one of these things, shake it up in your hand, and toss it onto a surface. And there you see... I rolled a four. Okay, so that's how you roll one die. <laughs> how you roll two dice, you take two of them, roll them around your hands, toss them, and there's a, a one and a two. Um, but the critical thing about rolling two dice is that you then add them together. So I say that I rolled a three. Um, and now that I have, um, done that part, which is probably review for most of you. So when I'm talking about how ways of rolling dice, um, I'm thinking like that the, the, the dice are, are more of an abstract thing here because there, there, are, there are different kinds of dice that aren't really different ways of rolling two dice. Um, we have here like skew d6, which has different symmetries than or less symmetry than the regular um, dice, but still topologically, they're, they're cubes. Uh, the dice labs, um, die pyramid dice, which have an edge on the top instead of a uh, face on the top, but they're still numbered one to six, and you can still get each number from one to six, um, an equal number, equal pr probability. And there's some interesting things like a die inside another die, but there's, it's still, for the purpose of rolling it, it's, it's still the same. The transparent ones here are, are meant for overhead projectors, and they're, they're dodecahedra that have six of the 12 sides have pips on them. And you can either get a number by it being the bottom or by be it being on the top. So this is a little bit different in that there are 12 sides, but you can think of there being equivalence classes that they, there's six different sets of two faces, and it's still numbered one through six. This table shows the, the probabilities of, of every number that you can get with when you roll a pair of dice and, and take the sum. Um, and you see like there, there are extremes like from, and when you get two, there's only one way, there's two ways to get a three. So there's, there's 36 total entries in this table and sevens are the most common. There's, there's six different ways to get them. If you play a game like Settlers of Catan, um, the, this V-shaped distribution is important because you want to get access to territories that are that will get. So settlers of Catan, you roll dice, and and if you if the right number comes up, you get resources from from a territory that that is associated with that number. Um, so twos and twelves are make not great territories to get resources from, and sixes and eights are better. So that's that's why this distribution is is kind of nice for games like that. And you might think that like one way that we could do a pair of dice that's different is we have one that's we, we add one to it. So instead of it being one through six, it's two through seven. And the other one, we subtract one from it. And so it's zero through five instead of one through six. And it's that works. It's also a little bit unsatisfying because it gives us this exact same table. If we're thinking of something that is a different way to roll two dice, we want to we would kind of like something that gives a different table, has these, these numbers scrambled around a bit. That is indeed what Sickerman dice are. Um, you can see just on first glance, these are a little bit weird. There's one that has two twos on it, and there's one that has an eight. And that's a weird number to see on a six-sided die. Um, just to unfold these so you can see all six sides. Um, if you saw Eric Domain's talk yesterday, it was all about folding shapes into cubes. And so um, I just want to apologize to anyone who saw that talk because 
I'm unfolding these one of the boring ways. There, there are much more interesting ways that involved dividing things diagonally and, and using lines that are in the half grid lines. Um, but you can see there's the blue die had a one, two twos, two threes, and a four. And the green die had a one, a three, a four, five, six, and an eight. When you look at these, think, how can these possibly work as a die roll? Um, I should probably actually use it, um, explain a little bit of terminology here. If you're not familiar with tabletop role playing games, there's, there's the, the D notation, which is D6 is a six sided die, so D8 is an eight sided die. And what we've been talking about is 2D6, which is two six sided dies summed together. Um, so, yeah, we have two six-sided dice here, and it seems strange that this will, will give us a 2d6 roll. Um, but you make that same chart that, that we did before with the regular dice, and it does. You have one, two, two threes. You can find three fours and four fives and five sixes and six sevens. And then it's symmetrical, so it works the same way if you rotate it 180 degrees, with, and you do the same thing with the higher numbers going down from 12. So this works and it's amazing. And this is where I want to like ask, where could this come from? And fortunately we have the person that is who it came from. So I'm going to ask George Sickerman to be here and video and unmuted and we can have an, a little bit of an interview. I guess the first thing I want to ask is how did you come up with this? What, where did that come from? Well, I was reading a book, uh, a, a book, which was sort of a survey of mathematics for the general public. And one of the chapters was devoted to probability. And it had a, a copy of the table that you just showed us for conventional six-sided dice. And I, I looked at that matrix and uh, I had seen it many times, of course, but uh, I was feeling experimental. So I wondered if there were some way to rearrange the numbers in the matrix and then change the numbers along the, the top and side to generate those, that different arrangement in the matrix. So I, I got out a pencil and paper. Uh, I'm sure the older members of the audience will remember pencil and paper. And uh, I experimented a bit, and I was delighted to find that there was one way to do that. And since there was no World Wide Web in those days, I naturally wrote to Martin Gardner and told him about it. Yeah, that, um, I, I should read this little blurb that comes on, on the package of dice that I got. It says, uh, Martin Gardner reported on the discovery of these dice by Colonel George Sickerman of Buffalo, New York, New York in a 1978 article in Scientific American. When I look at Martin Gardner's books and columns, I see that this, it's so collaborative. There's, there's so much input from readers. I'm just curious, like, what, what that was like reading those Scientific American columns in the day and, and deciding to, to contact Martin Gardner and, and be part of them. Well, it, it was natural. For many years, I had gone to the library at least once a month to read Martin Gardner's mathematical games column in Scientific American. And uh, for me, he was the prime source of information about recreational mathematics. I loved his columns. So when I stumbled on this, uh, these Sickerman dice, as they came to be known, <laughs> I naturally wrote to him and told him about them. And as it happened, uh, he, he was planning a column about dice so, or uh, with a column that would mention dice. So he decided to write it up and add it to the column. Did you, so did you um, correspond with him with anything else besides the dice? Oh yes, uh, it, that was not the first time I wrote to Martin Gardner. The first time was uh, when I, discovered a, a puzzle involving pool balls. Uh, some of you may know of the puzzle. Uh, I was watching a game of pool and I wondered whether the 15 balls could be racked up in the usual triangular formation. 
So the, the number on each ball was the difference between the numbers on the balls just behind it. I, I sent that to Martin Gardner. That was my first letter to him. Yeah, and he liked the puzzle and he used it in one of his end of year uh, puzzle columns. Yeah, I was I was looking at, I made a, a Python program to, to find variations where you have two size four triangles instead of one size five triangle and, and that ah. kind of thing. Many people tried variations on that puzzle. Getting back to the dice, um, what what was your reaction to how they were received and and when people started? I, I assume that 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 proof of that use po factoring um, polynomials that that was a way of getting at that you weren't aware of until that came out. Oh um, well, that's quite right. Uh, a couple of scholarly articles about renumbering dice appeared in, in math journals uh, not long after Martin Gardner published these dice. And uh, it was only after reading uh, Galleon and Rusin's article that I, I realized that you could use cyclotomic polynomials okay. to analyze uh, renumbered dice. It, it worked really very nicely. And I even wrote a program that would apply that method. Uh, you can get it off my website. Well, actually, I have the link up for your, your page about the Sickerman dice, so I will paste that into the chat right now. Then so later when, when people actually started making physical versions of the Sickerman dice, how did that, that feel to have it like actually be in the world? <laughs> Well, I wasn't too surprised. I had already noticed that uh, things that were purely conceptual, uh, once the internet started to evolve, uh, concepts had a way of suddenly turning into reality uh, <laughs> without any people having to do anything. All it took was one person to move in and, and do it, and suddenly it existed. I've seen this over and over. Did you ever hear of a, a Suicide Squid comic book? I'm not familiar with that one. No, uh, it, it was in a forum called Usenet. There was a comic oh, book yeah. called Suicide Squad and somebody talking about it mistyped it and typed Suicide Squid. Within a year of that, Somebody appeared on a television sitcom wearing a Suicide Squid sweatshirt. <laughs> wow. Things just become real so much faster now. Anyway, I, I was interested enough to buy a pair of the dice from a company called GameStation.net. They're not around anymore. But I remember that the, the little brochure that came with the dice mentioned that they were designed by a famous military strategist. <laughs> uh, that was a bit of, uh, well, prevarication. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have uh, never been in the army. Yeah, th that, that, that's not in this brochure. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I've gotten, I have two, two physical pairs. I have um, that green and blue one, and I have the one with the weird um, patterns that, that was from Legends of Ravenhall that was more recent. And oh, yeah. the, the Raven Hall dice. Yeah, and I just got a question from from Colin that 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 he asked like if you recalled when you came up with the dice. Oh, or Colin, not um, Colin. Well, let's see. Uh, I I wrote to Martin Gardner in late January of 1977, so okay. it was probably earlier in the month. Okay. Well, now we have we have the official creation date of, of the, the Sickerman dice. Um, and Kate Jones just asked it asked in the chat. Maybe maybe we ask why a non-military genius is called a, a colonel. Oh, um, well, that's uh, not relevant to Sickerman dice, but it's quite simple. In the early 1970s, when Bobby Fischer was making headlines on his way to the World Chess Championship. A, a fellow club member and I started running chess tournaments in the Buffalo area. And uh, 
around that time, the a, com, a magazine called Chess Life reported on an opening that someone was playing called the Fried Fox opening. It, it was a, a weird opening, but uh, I remember the name. And later, when I had occasion to write to a fellow tournament director in Niagara Falls, I wrote it on the letterhead of Kentucky Fried Fox and signed myself Colonel Sickers. Wow. <laughs> well, uh, I realized that that could be a drawing point for our tournaments. So I started showing up at our chess tournaments in uniform, a cheap work uniform with some homemade insignia, and it worked. People came from all over the state to, to watch this colonel helping to run a chess tournament. Wow, that's uh, that's a interesting, a fun story. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, it, it works not only for chess, but also for mathematics. So I still use it for my puzzles and things like that. All right. Well, at this point, I, I think I, I want to get back to talking about the dice because we have a much more of other kinds of dice to get to. Um, and But it's, it's been great talking to you. I've enjoyed this. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, thanks for coming. Think a little bit about, like, is there more than one way to roll one die? And this is this is going somewhere. One thing you can do is because the six the six sided die, the six has factors of two and three, you can have, you can take that factor of three and, and have a zero times three and a three times, or one times three, and then on, have another die where you have one, two, and three. And I'm showing these as, as six sided dice next to them, but they could be a three sided die and a, and a, a two sided die or, or a coin if you want. That is another way to roll one die is to have two dice and, that look like this and roll them and add them together. Um, and there's another way. Instead of taking the, the, the three factor, you take the, the two factor out. You have a zero, two, and four, and then a one and a two. But I've decided to move the one over because I'm, I, have, I have reasons um, from, from the, the one and two the two sided die move that that one up to the so subtract one from that die and add one to the the zero two and four die so I have a one three and five and I thought this is interesting but now that we have these four dice we can regroup them um, so instead of adding the the north and the east and then adding the south and the west dice to get our two dice, we could go the other way. What's fun about this, it's the sucker man dice. I was wondering if, if, if um, George had come up with it this way, because this, this is when I, um, this is the only way that I, I, I when I've looked at, at them before, I just like had no idea how you'd come up with that. And then I was playing with, with um, these dice that are split into two and just realized, oh, you can regroup them another way. And in fact, you could regroup them a completely different way. You could have just the one, three, five die on, on the um, left side, and then group the other three together. Um, so you had the, when you group the other three, that's a that's two times three times two possibilities. So you would have to use a twelve-sided die or a dodecahedron. So a three-sided die and a twelve-sided die, and it turns out this has been made by the dice lab and. That is what it is, um, those two dice there. Um, and you can see the, the numbers on the 12 sided die um, I listed out since you can't actually see them on, on the picture. It goes one, two, three, four, four, five, five, six, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, and then you could, um, I mean, the limit of this craziness, you, you, you could, you could group them so you have two twos in, in one and two threes in the other and have a four-sided die and a nine-sided die. Um, a nine-sided die is kind of a difficult thing to actually make in a particularly elegant way. There are less elegant ways, I'm sure. But um, So I've never seen that done as physical dice. Um, 
but the, the limit of glomming these dice together would be just glom them all together, all four of them. And then you have a die that has 36 sides and one of them is every number in that entire table that we had at the beginning. And that has also been done. And this I got through a Kickstarter a while back. Um, it's not a very good die to use as a die. The numbers are really tiny and the sides have really shallow angles between them, which like I, I'm guessing that I rolled a 10 in this picture, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, and some of the numbers you can sort of see, I think that the eight next, almost on, on the edge of what we can see is green. And there's, there's a few numbers that, that you know, even numbers that are green to um, denote. So yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a two, four, six, eight, 10 and 12 that are green. Um, so games like Monopoly that, that care about whether you roll doubles, will you'll be able to see by by seeing the color there, which I was not very good at seeing. And then, so the next thing I'm gonna talk about is the shaker dice. Um, this is something that was a different Kickstarter that I found that had a basically a credit card shaped um, object with a bunch of reservoirs with, with these numbered channels on every one and you could shake it and then pick your which channel you wanted to care about and one of them would be a d8 one of them would be a d4 and one of them would be a d6 etc and i looked at that and i had a couple of problems with it one of which was that in order to do the credit card size the little balls were like each very tiny and you you'd have to read it from very close so i wanted to use something bigger and i also wanted to, to split them out so that you could tell which die you're rolling when you do this, um, when you shake and, and, and roll one of these. Um, and so and these the, the numbers um, that you see are, are engraved on the clear plastic layer that's in front of these balls. The, I'm using um, semi-precious gems. It's carnelian for the, the red balls and rose quartz for the white ones. The simplest form is just this, this one that I'm using for the D4. It has numbers one through four. You shake it, and the red ball comes up. Since the, the white numbers um, sort of blend into the white balls, you, you just see the, the, number, the white number that's on top of the red ball, and that's a four. So that's, that's what we rolled here. And, and my next idea with this is, well, I'm not really using the other side of this. So we could have it be two dice at the same time. If you shake it and set it down, it's a D4. If you shake it and then toss it, it's a D8, which could land on either of these sides. One has numbers five through eight, and the other one has numbers one through four. Um, and then I thought, well, OK, that's good. We have two of the standard role-playing dice. Then we should get to the other ones. So the D6, well, that's. The problem is the D4 is already pretty big. And if I go to D6 and have six balls with these, these larger balls that are, these are little four millimeter um, gemstone balls, um, that it would just be huge and unwieldy. And then I realized that I could use two red balls instead of one, and now, the number of possibilities is four choose two, which is six. So there ought to be a way to label these to have it be a D6. And there is. And if you get any two of these numbers and subtract them, you, you get your, your dice roll. And then I did the same thing that I did with the D4s and have this other set of numbers that gives you the numbers seven through 12. So you can shake it and toss it, and you have a D12 instead of a D6. Um, but let's just get into a little bit about how that, how those numbers work. You, you can think of, of the numbers on the, the positions where the balls can be as being nodes in a graph. And the, the roll, the number that you get for the roll as being an edge on the graph. Um, and so it turns out what you want is a, a graceful graph. A, a graceful graph is a term for 
a graph that you've labeled the numbers so that you have all of the possible differences um, between one and the number of edges for um, the labels on the edges. And, and you see with this, this, this set of numbers, that gives us a graceful graph that, that gives us all the numbers from one to six. You roll a zero to one, you get a one. You roll, well, the zeros are obvious. You get the one, four, and six. And then the four with the six gives you a two. The one and the four gives you a three. And the one and the six gives you a five. And then you have, you have all six of your numbers. Um, and so that, that's called a graceful graph. And another um, way of thinking of this, that set of numbers as a, is a ruler that has marks on it where the, the distances between the marks are, um, are all of those numbers from one to six. And that's called a perfect golem ruler. And what I did with the other graph um, for the other side of the, the die, I am adding instead of subtracting. And that's, there's a term for the kind of graph that you get that will give you all the numbers between one and, and your number of, of, um, of edges. And it's called a harmonious graph, but that generally, it, it's assumed that you're taking the numbers mod the number of edges you have. So this is, this is not an actual harmonious graph. This is just harmony-ish. Um, and that's, that gives us the numbers from seven to 12 when we, when we add them all up. Um, and so you can do this, the, the, if you subtract three from, from all of those numbers on that, that, that seven to 12 side of the, the, the D6 slash D12, if you subtract three from all of those, you get um, an actual D6. This is actually a harmonious numbering. Um, and so I've rolled a three on this side and a six on this side. And, and this, is, this is actually, if you think of it about it in terms of what you get after adding, this is a normal standard set of, of 2D6. This is, this is not weird except in so far as there's there is adding going on for the shaker dice stuff. But this, this also has two sides like the other ones and you don't have to toss it. So um, I figure I should be doing something with the other side. And so I'm using a different set of numbers and this different set of numbers happens to give us Sickerman dice. Um, it's, so you can see you get one, two, and two, and then you add the one in with the other with the two, so you get three, three, and the, the two twos gives you four. So that's that's the low Sickerman die, and this one will give you one, three, five, for adding to zero, and then four and six and eight, and and that's the high Sickerman die. And so this it's kind of cool. We have we have both kinds of dice in in one thing that you can shake and set down and not even have to toss. So it's not going to fly all over the place. I came up with a, a D10 and a D20 for the, the, the shaker dice too. Oh, I didn't get to this one. Um, those, those ones aren't really relevant to the talk, so I'm not going to talk about them much. This one is an interesting idea. You have one channel instead of two. And the number of balls here, there are nine balls. And it turns out that two choose nine. So if you have nine balls and two of them are red, that is 36. So it's, we have this nice coincidence that 36 is both a triangular and a square number. And so I thought there's got to be a way to do that. You have, have two dark balls and out of nine and make it be a 2d6. And it turns out that there is. And I did not find it first. Um, this a version using cards um, was um, discovered by a uh, Metafilter user named Icon Jack, and I will paste that into the chat um, so you can see the where where this came from. It was using uh, playing cards rather than balls, and um, I came up with this and then discovered that, that it had been found before. So what you do with these is you add together the two numbers you get and then divide by two, so take the mean. Um, so this, I got a three and a five. The mean is eight over two or four. Um, and this, this set of numbers gives you all of that table of probabilities in, in the numbers that you can get. And I've put, um, it's not easy to see it in this picture, but there are 
um, there are lines between the first five and the second five and the first nine and the second nine. And those lines are there for the purpose of determining doubles again. If you get two positions that are next to each other and that do not straddle one of those lines, that counts as a doubles roll. So the one in the three is a two, the three and the five is that are next to each other, not the other three and the five, um, is, a four, is the doubles version of the four. And then there's one for every even number, there's one way to make it that does not straddle that, that are adjacent to each other. And, and well, um, I mean, the numbers that do straddle the line aren't going to give you doubles because they give you odd numbers. But just to be clear, which ones are the ones that give you doubles, that's, that's how you do that. So that's all the ways I've come up with doing D6s as shaker dice. Now, the next one, Matt Parker did a video about the game called Dobble or Spot It that has a bunch of cards that you that have different pictures on them and you try to be the first one to find the, the little icon on both cards that matches. And I thought, well, that would be an interesting thing, thing to do with dice. You could have all these different icons and, and roll two dice and find the matching icon on both dice. And it's, it's less interesting from a mathematical perspective than doing it with cards because this, this double thing, it turns out that the mathematical structure turn, is a finite projective plane and it's really fun stuff. And you should totally watch that Matt Parker video. Um, then I thought, well, what if the, instead of using these various pictures of different things and matching them that, that don't mean anything, what if the, what you were making was the numbers one through 12, numbers two through 12, and the, the number of ways to make each of them is, gives you that, that 2D6 distribution. So these are, are what I call mono match dice. You can see there's, there's one two on each die. So that, that gives you one way of getting the two. Two sevens on one die and three sevens on the other die. So that it gives you six ways to get a seven. And that, that goes for all of, of the, the probabilities in our, our table. Finding this is, is a, a set that works for this. It's, it's not hard. It's not quite trivial, but it's not very hard at all. I think it's, it's kind of fun to be able to, to get the result without doing any adding whatsoever. And after I did this, I was thinking, OK, can I find other ways to do to get 2D6? Can I use other operations, like use bitwise operations? And that didn't work. And I thought, well, if I go to, if I go to ternary, maybe tritwise operations. And that didn't work either. And then I thought, well, if I have dice with pips, I could do pipwise operations. And what would that even look like? And this is what that looks like. Um, so you can think of this as you have two dice that you roll them, you rotate them so that the, the pips, which are ellipses, have the same orientation. And then you mentally overlay the, the two dice that you rolled, the two sides that you rolled. Um, so when I showed this to somebody, they, they said, OK, so if you roll a three and a two, what do you get? A, a, a three or a five? And I was like, yes, those are the two possibilities. And they said, no, which? Because it, these, these threes, the ones that go in one direction of a diagonal are, are different from the other ones. But I think that there is something in our brains that we see the, the pip, um, the pip patterns as symbols that automatically turn into something more abstract. And so we don't see this three as different from, see the, the, the backslash looking three as, as looking as being different from the forward slash looking three, even though they really are for this purpose. So, and I will show the table for this one because it's, so you can see that, that if you roll one of the threes with the two, it just overlays it, the, the, the two perfectly. And the other way, it makes a diagonal going the other way and gives you a five. And if you look at this, we have, we have our 2D6 distribution pattern. It's all jumbled up a little bit, but there's one, two, two threes, three, four, et cetera. Um, and that is um, the last of, of the, the dice that I've come up with that make 2D6. Um, so 
Um, thank you. And um, we can move to Q&A now. Thank you, Alejandre. So we did have a few questions um, interspersed. There's not a symmetric version of these dice, which count down from the top. Let's see, one would have six, five, five, four, four, three. That was the question. Now, the thing is that, that both of the dice are, are symmetric. If you, if you reflect the numbers over, over the mean of, those num of the numbers on the die, you get the same, same die back. So I want to know um, which of these dice and shakers you've designed. Have any of them been um, commercially produced? Well, I was planning on, on having a small batch to, to sell at a vendor table at G4G, but oh, nice. I'm also thinking about doing a, um, a Kickstarter or some kind of crowdfunding for the shaker dice mm -hmm. um, because I didn't show the, the D10 and the, the D20, but it makes up a, a full um, role-playing game set um, with all of them. So I think it, it, would, it has some, some real possibilities there. That makes sense. I liked the uh, the mono match dice. It took me a minute to to quite grok what they were, but that that's a neat idea. Yeah, it's, it's is is that a, the unique way of doing that? There are lots and lots of ways, and it's easy to find them, and um, you can sort of get into if you want a, a more interesting puzzle, finding more balanced ways to to have the numbers on each die, mm -hmm. um, but. Um, yeah, um, when I posted this to my blog, Bryce Hurt did did some of that, and so it's in, in my um, comments that um, that blog entry, and that gives you all of my blog posts that are tagged dice, um, some of which are not about this particular kind of, of dice problem, um, but if you want to get to my blog posts more generally, you can go from there. I, I do a lot of polyform stuff. That's That's my biggest biggest proportion of, of my blog posts. Thank you again, Alexandre and, and George. That was that was definitely a lot of fun and I want some of those dice. Thank you.